Um, uh, it's really been a, a pleasure to uh, have uh, Peanut reach out and, and ask me to, um, to have an opportunity to speak with you. So um, my goal for this um, hour or so um, will be to talk a little bit about uh, babies and, and sleep and uh, maybe some of their other behaviors as well, and then answer some questions about, um, about babies and sleep as well that have already been uh, submitted. Um, maybe talk a little bit about toddlers as well, just because uh, they grow up. <laughs> they, uh, it seems like those first few months can last forever, but actually they really go faster than you could possibly imagine. You know, so many people kind of feel like you want to just put them in a little snow globe and, and keep them forever the way they are, because even though the days are, the days are long, um, they go by more quickly than you can, than you really can believe. Um, and as a father of a 36 year old, I can tell you that's really the truth. Um, so um, many, many different things to talk about. It, you may have heard of The Happiest Baby on the Block and thank you, Tricia, for mentioning that. That's a, a book and a, and a video to um, help people understand how to uh, calm their crying babies and, and how to get more sleep. It's kind of interesting when you look at babies, there are really three main jobs you have when you're taking care of a new baby. Um, feed the baby, um, calm the crying, and get sleep. And pretty much everything else works its way out. You know, bathing the baby and, um, you know, umbilical cord care and, um, you know, changing a diaper. Those things work out without that much um, uh, trial and error. Uh, feeding, there's a lot of help for, right? There are books and videos and magazines and lactation consultants and La Leche League. And so there's lots of great support to help with breastfeeding. And then of course, if you're bottle feeding, um, there's lots of great um, alternatives as well. And your doctor or nurse practitioner or midwife can help you with that as well. Um, not so much help with crying and exhaustion. As a matter of fact, there's kind of a, um, a general saying in, in the world about babies that is, you know, you, you know they're not gonna be easy. You're gonna be up a lot. That's just what babies do. They fuss a lot, they wake up a lot, they need to be fed all throughout the night. So prepare yourselves for that because it's gonna be challenging. And, and, and it is challenging. And for some parents, obviously more than others, every baby's a bit different. Some are a bit easier, better sleepers, and some are a little bit more wakeful at night. But to give you an idea of how um, stressful it can be uh, when, you're, when you're dealing with the baby's crying and, and, and your own fatigue, um, it helps to know that the, the, the Navy SEALs, the special operations forces in, our, in the US military are trained to endure torture by putting them through chronic sleep deprivation with the sound of babies crying over loudspeakers. So it's kind of the everyday life of parents uh, across the country, um, but it can really get on your nerves. Um, it's like that fingernails on a chalkboard kind of a experience that even though you love your child and, and you, you want to do everything for them, it's hard when you're exhausted. And if the crying goes and goes and there's nothing more you want than being able to calm the baby and nothing more frustrating when you can't. So, so it turns out that there are lots of myths about babies and crying and sleep and misconceptions. Um, and, um, and lots of misconceptions about having babies too. I mean, you 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 know you think that nine months is 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 a long enough period of of gestation, and then you have your baby, and that they're going to be ready for the world. But they're really not ready for the world until they're really three or four months of age. That's when they start smiling more and cooing more and interacting more. And you say, "Hi, baby," and your baby goes. And then you have a dialogue back and forth. They can't do that in the first week or two of life. It's going to take several months for them to have that coordination. Even sucking on their fingers. People say, let your baby suck on the fingers. Because in the womb, they can suck on their hands. But in the womb, they have a, a wall around them. So they really can't extend their hands 
out or, or in any direction. So they're really kept very close to the face. So it's much easier to suck your thumb than it is once you're born in this real world where that's so big for babies. And so the idea that you can expect your newborn baby or even the first couple of months of life to be coordinated at sucking their fingers is not, is not valid because it takes them months for the development to work its way down. First, the eyes get developed and they can look to the right and they can look to the left and they can follow you as you cross the room. I mean, that takes weeks to, to a month or two to really for them to get good at that. Then their faces get better. Then they can smile and they can um, uh, um, uh, frown more under their own control. I mean, they do a little bit of that in the first months because it's just reflexive. It's just automatic behavior. But but really smiling when they want to, volitional smiling or willful smiling, usually takes two months to three months for them to be able to be getting good at that. And then their necks get stronger and then their shoulders get stronger and the upper back and then their arms get a little more coordinated and finally goes to the fingers and ultimately the fingertips at, at eight or nine months. It's an interesting process as the development moves down the body. Um, but to say that in the beginning, they don't have a lot of that coordination. And so um, in my work, I talk about this concept of the fourth trimester, which is the idea that it really takes babies a good three or four months or sometimes five months to, to be ready to be in the world, to be uh, you know, regular members of the team. And during those first four months or so, you imitate your womb. And so to imitate your womb, you need to know what it's like in there. And it turns out it is, um, it's pretty interesting inside there. It is, um, it's loud. It's, it's actually as loud as a, as, a, as a vacuum cleaner, 24 hours a day. Vroom, vroom, vroom. People you know when, they, when you go in for your, um, for your checkup at the, at the obstetrician, they'll put this microphone on your, on, your, um, on your belly and you'll hear a kind of a sound. But that's not what babies hear inside because babies are underwater. So what they hear is everything, everything is filtered and it's down uh, low pitched. And so what a baby really hears is more of a kind of sound. And that becomes important because if you use a sound machine or something to soothe your baby into sleep, you want something that's low pitch and rumbly. You don't want something that's very high pitched and squeaky and irritating because it's not gonna be as effective for a baby or for you. It'd be hard to sleep in the room if it's too high pitched. So other um, kind of myths and misconceptions are this thing about sound that you know everyone says, the baby's sleeping, tiptoe, everyone be quiet. But actually babies sleep better when, they're, when there's noise around them. Uh, babies can sleep better at a crowded party or at a basketball game than an adult can. We, we can't do that very well at all, but babies go to sleep almost instantaneously in those situations. So that's why we use sound machines or, or white noise for babies when they're sleeping because the quiet of the room is actually sensory depriving. It's too still, it's too empty, it's too um, um, uh, free floating, there's not enough form around the babies to make them feel reassured. Um, the other thing is the idea that, um, that, that the normal family, what is a normal family? Well, it's, we tend to think of it as, as two parents and a child, um, but that's completely abnormal, completely. I mean, up until a hundred years ago and for the entire history of humanity, the only normal family was um, an extended family. It was, you know, parents and a child and a grandmother and a mother and an aunt and, and your next door neighbors. And it was seven or eight or nine people. And in fact, the mother was babied as much as she was babying the baby. Um, and that was the process. And then you helped your friend. And then when they had a baby four months later, um, I mean, they helped you. And when they had a baby four months later, you helped them. And that was the process. And now we're locked up in, especially with COVID now, we're locked up into our homes and apartments and we don't have the help of extended family. Um, and many people don't even think they deserve that help. They think that a normal mother just sucks it up and deals with it on her own or a normal dad just, you know, you just kind of, you just kind of grin and bear it. Um, but it's, it's hard. It's hard work, especially if you have 
a toddler as well, but even with just a baby, all of those hours, you know, for you to imitate what your uterus did for free takes, takes a lot of effort. Um, because even if you hold your baby 12 hours a day and you rock your baby for eight hours a day in your arms and you feed your baby every two hours, from your baby's point of view, that's a, a ripoff, honestly, because up until the instant of birth, you held them 24 hours a day, you rocked them 24 hours a day, you fed them every single second. And so from your baby's point of view, they are doing <laughs> you a favor to be quiet you know, for a couple of hours um, and to put up with only being held 12 hours a day. But it's pretty interesting. Like I said, people are taught that, well, babies have to wake up a lot. They're gonna cry. Some babies cry for hours a day. We call it colic, which is kind of a mysterious problem. Uh, if you read a pediatric book or a parenting book, it'll say, we don't know what causes colic, but babies outgrow it and they doesn't seem to be related to any disease for the most part, which is true. But, um, but it's kind of strange, isn't it? To think that babies can cry for hours and we don't know what, I mean, we can put a man on the moon. We can, you know, speak to Antarctica, in, you know, in four seconds. Um, why wouldn't we be able to figure out why baby is crying? Kind of seems wrong. Seems like we should be able to do that. Um, and that's where it kind of gets confusing because then you start speaking to your friends. Um, if I mean, you may have experience yourself. Some people did a lot of babysitting or they raised their younger brothers and sisters. But it's remarkable how many people have babies today and they have very little experience. I mean, they're good at school and maybe they have a good job and they're competent at work. But just because you've seen babies on television or you or, your, or you, you saw your cousin's baby or your sister's baby doesn't mean that you are suddenly competent to take care of a baby. I mean, not that it's rocket science. It's not the hardest thing in the world. But there are skills and there are techniques and there's insight that can make it easier for you or make it more difficult if you if you don't know about that. And those are the things I want to I really want to talk about. But the this idea that you should do it on your own you know, there's that saying macho, a guy who's very macho just depends on himself. And there's a term uh, macha, you know, that a, a woman feels like she should do everything. And every time her baby wakes up, she should be there all night long, all day long. And that was really kind of never done by mothers in history. You always had people helping you out. And so, um, you know, that's the reality though. You know, we have smaller families and you need to be there for your baby. So the question is, how can I arrange things so I get a little more sleep, the baby gets a little bit more calm. I have the skills I need to be able to meet my baby's needs. I can nurse my baby or feed my baby successfully and get through these first four or five months um, without it being so, so harsh and so difficult that it puts me into a tailspin. The, sa the sad thing is that crying babies and exhaustion, it's not just a joke. It's not just something that you see on a sitcom, you know, oh, that crazy mom, she was so tired. She went and brushed her teeth with the sunscreen instead of her toothpaste, you know, um, or fell asleep at a red light. Um, it's burdensome. It's, it's challenging. And for some parents, it's crushing um, if they don't have the help and they have a challenging baby and in fact, we talk about issues like postpartum depression and anxiety, which can affect up to 20% of new mothers and many new fathers. Um, and the chief triggers for those are not hormonal changes. They're exhaustion and, and feeling overwhelmed and feeling like you have nobody to turn to, that it's all on your shoulders. Um, things like... Um, even, even overweight, trying to lose your baby weight. When you're sleep deprived, you know, you know how it goes. You know, you, you eat carbs, you're kind of, you know, comfort feeding yourself, you're eating impulsively, uh, you're not exercising. So it makes it hard to lose that baby weight. And then you judge yourself about that perhaps. And, and that becomes a negative cycle. So sleep and calming crying are not just a task that you have, but they are major skills that will differentiate between feeling overwhelmed and, and like a failure and feeling, you know, I've got this, I can, I can handle this. I'm, I'm good at this actually. And I know my baby loves me and I know that I'm, I'm, I'm effective at calming my baby down. So, so the fourth trimester is based on the idea that we're imitating the womb. 
And so what is it like in the womb? Well, you have to understand five characteristics of what life is like in the womb. Um, and I call them the five S's. And these are the things that you're trying to imitate with your baby and that you probably naturally imitate with your baby to calm them down. Um, so one is um, swaddling, which is wrapping the baby snugly with the arms at the side. The hips are loose, but the arms are tightly at the side. Um, the second is the side or stomach position. The back is the only safe position for sleep, but it's the worst position for calming a crying baby. They feel like they're falling. All of this, by the way, is demonstrated. I mean, it's talked about in my book, The Happiest Baby on the Block, but, uh, and it's a good book and it has lots of interesting stories and anthropology, et cetera. But to really learn these techniques, um, you don't need to read a 200 page book. What I would recommend is taking a look at the streaming video that we have, it's a 30 minute video. I mean, you can find stuff on the internet and, and YouTube, but it really, I think helps to spend 30 minutes to learn how to be a good baby calmer and help your baby sleep. Um, and so uh, that's on our website, thehappiestbaby.com or a number of other places you can find that on the internet. Um, so the five S's are swaddling, the side or stomach position for calming a baby, the back is for sleep. The third S is shushing or white noise. Uh, the fourth S is swinging or rhythmic motion. And the fifth S is sucking. And it turns out that every baby's, I mean, babies are alike, right? I mean, pretty similar, but they're not cookie cutter. They are a little bit different. And um, uh, some babies, they, they really all need to be swaddled, even though I know Parents will say, my baby hates swaddling and I tried to swaddle my baby and um, you know he fights it and struggles and he clearly doesn't enjoy it. He wants his hands free. That's what he likes. And babies do struggle against swaddling because in the womb, they're packaged like this. And within a couple of weeks, their arms start to stretch and, and kind of spread out and get a little bit more relaxed and down at their sides. But when they get upset, boing, they go right back to that fetal position. And so when you try to straighten their arms and swallow them, they fight you, they resist you, and you think that your baby doesn't like it. But honestly, your baby doesn't have control over their body. And your baby doesn't get a vote. You know, with rights come responsibilities, and babies don't have enough responsibility to be able to earn the freedom, not until they're really four or five months of age. And they're really much better with their hands and it's self-soothing. So um, at least this is the way I look at it. And, and so I recommend swaddling all babies for sleep and for crying. If they're not asleep and they're not crying, they don't need to be swaddled. Um, and, um, and it's with the arms down and it's very snug. There are different ways to swaddle babies. There, you can use a regular big swaddle blanket or there are pre-made swaddle blankets. We have one called Sleepy, um, that uh, S-L-E-E-P-E-A that was rated the number one swaddle by, um, by the New York Times. So I was proud about that. Excuse me one second. Um, and, um, and so they're, they're very similar, but they do have differences. So some babies you swaddle, and then the thing that really soothes them is sound. So you swaddle them and you go, shh, shh, shh. And they melt in your arms. They just get so quiet and start looking. Where's that sound coming from? And they, they become alert and interested in what's going on. Or they fall asleep if they're tired and ready to fall asleep. Other babies, you shush them. It does nothing until you give them a little bit of bouncy motion, a little swinging motion, and let their heads jiggle a little bit, kind of like jello on a plate. You have to get a little bit of bobble for this to work. If you're holding the head and not allowing it to move, then, um, then the, the sensors inside the inner ear are not making these little waves that it turns out that is the sensation that's actually soothing babies. Um, other babies, you do sound and motion, doesn't really work. What they really want to do is lie on their stomachs or over your shoulder. And parents will say all the time, nothing works except if I let the baby sleep on me in the bed, which obviously is not safe. And, and there are ways around that. There, and that's really kind of the point here is that um, if a baby has one particular preference, sometimes if you give them enough of the other things, you 
you make them feel like okay, it's not really exactly what I want, but it's it's good enough. I'll I'll I'll, I'll accept this as a compromise. So even if you're not giving them sleeping on the stomach, if you give them enough motion and sound, or maybe sucking, because that's the fifth S, um, then they'll give into that. Um, and that becomes pretty important in terms of where the baby sleeps, because um, because um, there there are certain things that you might be tempted to do that are risky with a baby in terms of sleeping, like putting them on the stomach or bringing them in bed with you, um, which uh, which dramatically increases the risk of infant sleep death. So it's kind of curious because you would kind of you would think that well, we've been around babies for thousands of years. We probably just know all this, right? I mean, you know, why does every generation have to keep relearning this? And yet when you go on the internet, there's so much controversy and people say, never swaddle your baby, always swaddle your baby, swaddle with the hands up, swaddle with the hands down, be quiet, have noise, you know, nurse them and then put them to sleep. Oh no, don't do that. Nurse them and then play with them and then put them to sleep. Um, put them on a schedule, never put them on a schedule, have them in bed with you. Don't have, I mean, you see what I mean? It, there are a lot of different opinions. And of course, there isn't one way that works for every baby um, there or every family. Um, so there are variations that you might um, that you might choose. Having said that, there are some absolutes that are going to be effective for the 95, 98 percent of all babies. For example, swaddling is one of those. Using white noise is one of those. Keeping them out of your bed is one of those. About 25% or one in four moms will say that within the last two weeks, she was so tired that she had the baby in bed with her, nursing the baby perhaps or feeding the baby. And she accidentally fell asleep and then woke up shocked and frightened um, and not realizing she had fallen asleep or fell asleep on a sofa, which is even more dangerous than in your own bed. And so, um, it's important to do the things that you have to do to help your baby sleep better. And, um, and what, I, what I hope to be is a source of information to give you practical and effective guidance that allows you to be successful. So you're not pulled in different directions by different opinions on the internet that may or may not be, may or may not be correct. Um, we, by the way, we have lots and lots of free information on our website, happiestbaby.com, um, that anyone can come to and, and just, um, you know, purchase required. Um, so when it comes to the feeding of your baby, there are important things to learn. And I recommend that you um, speak with La Leche League or speak with a breastfeeding consultant if you're going to be nursing, so that, or with your physician or your, or your nurse practitioner, to learn the, the practicalities about breastfeeding. And I'll just share one tip with you that um, it's so simple, and yet it's one of these strange things that people don't talk about it. And if, and if you don't know about this before you're having your baby, it can create massive pain and suffering and, and feelings of incompetence um, in the very first days of life. And that has to do with flat or inverted nipples. It turns out that uh, for most women, if you stimulate the nipple, it'll, it'll erect, you know, maybe a half an inch or so, give or take, a quarter of an inch at least. Um, but some women have nipples that when you stimulate the breast, they really don't erect very much at all, um, or they actually pull in. And that's what an inverted nipple is. Now, once you have the baby, and after a few days, if, if they're sucking on the breast, your breasts are gonna fill up with milk and they become what's called engorged, meaning that they're like balloons and they become tense. So they're so filled with milk and with blood, actually blood, the blood vessels swell up because those are the factories that are making the milk. And so that can, whatever nipple you have as the breast gets bigger and rounder, it tends to flatten out that nipple. So if you're flat to begin with, if the nipple is flat, then it's very hard for the baby to get something to latch onto. Um, and so we want to take care of flat nipples before the baby is born. And there are special things called um, nipple shields that you can put under your bra that have a little, it's like a donut, but with a hole just on one side. And you put it in the bra and your nipple starts to protrude through the opening and stretches and stretches and stretches. So over a month or two, your nipple can stretch out. Um, and then you won't have a problem when the baby is born, or you're less likely to have a problem. 
So that's a super easy thing to speak to your speak to your um, to your uh, pediatrician or your obstetrician really about to get some guidance on that, or your lactation consultant or your midwife or whomever is helping you. So um, so let's talk a little bit about um, about sleep. If you know the five S's, um, uh, those can really help you when your baby is crying and fussing. Um, and pretty much if you're doing the five S's correctly, and that's where the trick comes in, because the five S's don't just make a baby nostalgic for the womb, they're actually turning on a reflex. So a reflex in a baby is an automatic behavior that all babies are born with. So um, blinking is something you don't teach a baby. It's, they just are born knowing how to do that. Um, sucking, swallowing are normal reflexes that all babies are born with everywhere around the world. What wasn't known until my, my, my baby book came out is that babies are also born with a calming reflex. That's almost an off switch for crying and an on switch for sleep. And you activate that reflex by doing these five S's, the five things that imitate the womb experience. But to turn on a reflex, you kind of have to do it right. If you're doing it halfway right, it, it oftentimes fails. Kind of like hitting a knee reflex. If, you, if you're off by three inches, it doesn't work. If you hit the right place and you do it too softly, it doesn't work. So you have to hit it hard enough and in the right place. And then you'll get a reflex a thousand times in a row. Same thing with the five S's. You need to practice and swaddle correctly and shush correctly and, and jiggle them, swing them correctly um, to be able to be effective. Not that it's hard to do those things correctly. In fact, <laughs> what's interesting is that even though people tell you that there are some babies you can't calm and, and babies have to wake up every two or three hours at night, parents are also told that if you have a very fussy baby or if your baby's waking up a lot and you need to get some more sleep, what can you do? You can go for a car ride. And if you drove your baby all night long in the back seat of the car, they would sleep for an extra hour or two and they would cry less. And so the interesting thing is that we've always known how to reduce crying and increase sleep. We've just never really had the tools to be able to do that. And in fact, we've done just the opposite. We've put babies flat on their back in a quiet, still bed, unwrapped, free in the world, too much freedom for their arms. And then we go, well, why is my baby sleeping better? Why is my baby crying so much? Because you just took away everything that your baby was used to, or everything they had in the womb. I mean, if I did that to you, if I took away your bed and pillow and comforter and sheets, and just made you sleep on a cement floor, you could sleep on it, but you're not gonna sleep well. And same thing with babies. If you take everything away from them that they're used to, they're not gonna sleep well. So you can give them something like swaddling, uh, arms down swaddling, at least for the first couple of months or so. Uh, pediatricians now say, and I think that this is correct, that if the baby can roll over swaddled, then we, we need to stop swaddling them because we don't want a baby on the stomach swaddled uh, because then they can't lift their heads up very well and they have a higher risk of uh, stopping breathing. Um, and as many of you probably know, about 3,500 babies die in their sleep every year in the United States. Half of those babies die on their stomach and about half of them die in bed with their parent or on a sofa or some other unsafe location. So, um, so you, you, you want to be able, you don't want the baby rolling over when they're swaddled because that puts them into a, into a riskier situation. Uh, white noise is another great thing that anyone can use. It's not very expensive to do that. And that's another sensation that helps babies to be able to sleep better because the quiet and stillness all night, maybe something that you like, but it's not something that babies feel comfortable with. Um, in fact, I recommend white noise for at least the first year. And really, I mean, longer than that, a lot of adults find that they sleep better when they use white noise. Um, um, so, so what do you do for sleep? So you can wrap your baby and use white noise and those things can be helpful for the first couple of months. Um, uh, the white noise longer than that, but the swaddling for the first couple of months. And feed your baby. So how do you feed your baby to help them sleep at night? Well, what you wanna do is wake them up during the day. 
uh, because um, babies are pretty smart in a certain sense, is they're not going to eat and eat and eat and eat and eat more and more uh, if you offer them more and more. At a certain point, they're just going to stop eating. I've had enough. Thank you very much, mom. And it turns out the more you feed a baby during the daytime, the less they need at night because they got their calories during the day. So that means waking your baby up if they're napping more than an hour and a half or two hours. Um, and then feed them. And then if they're still tired, put them back down, let them sleep again. Um, but interrupting their sleep is not a bad thing. Even though they say never, never wake a sleeping baby, um, this is an exception to that rule. Um, and then when you feed the baby, um, you want to give them um, adequate amount of food. And that gets into another tricky one of these situations that you probably heard different answers to the question, but how long should you nurse a baby and should you nurse them on one side or two sides? And it turns out that um, you have to understand how the breasts work to really understand what's the best way to feed your baby. So the breasts make milk a drop every second, drop, drop, drop. And that milk then collects in a little, a little collecting system, a little bag, if you will, under the areola, under that brown circle of your nipple. And after two or three hours, that collection system gets filled and it gets tense and your breasts get hard and you feel uh, like, oh my gosh, my breasts are really full. I'm ready to feed my baby. Um, then the baby suckles and after a few seconds, um, you might experience what they call letdown, which sometimes even feels like electricity or a little prickly feeling, or sometimes you don't feel it at all, but you hear the baby starting to gulp. And you may even see milk leaking on the other side or even spraying out the other side sometimes. Um, after about five, six, seven minutes, your baby's gulping will slow down. You can hear, you can feel them relax. You can feel them kind of just melt a little bit in your arms and you hear less sucking. And what that means is that the collecting system has emptied. The ounce or ounce and a half or so in that system is gone. And now the baby is just suckling the drop, drop, drop at a time that's coming out. Meanwhile, your other breast is going, me, 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 take me, right? Because it's, it's full, it's ready to go. People might tell you that, well, you should nurse 20 minutes on one side because the baby needs the fore milk and the hind milk, the early milk, and then the late milk, which is fattier, richer milk. And uh, yeah, babies need both fore and hind milk. But you can do seven minutes on this side, burp your baby, and then switch to the other side and finish the meal there. So that way they get the fore milk on both sides and then they'll get the hind milk from the second side. Or you can even go back to the first side where the hind milk is waiting for you and do seven and seven and then back and seven and seven again. When you do that, your baby's gonna get an extra half an ounce or ounce of milk, which means that they're gonna be more satisfied that you're gonna have a shorter amount of time nursing the baby and the baby is gonna be able to sleep better at night. Um, another thing you can do to help your baby sleep better at night is something that they call a dream feed, where you wake your baby up um, um, maybe 11 o'clock or 1130, something like that. And you, you see if your baby will take another feeding and you kind of like top off the tank, right? And get them ready for a longer episode of sleep. So those are various things that you can do to help a baby sleep more. I'm going to answer, there were a number of questions that were asked about sleep training babies, uh, which really for the most part means letting them cry and into exhaustion or cry it out routine. And, um, and that's definitely something that parents can do. A lot of pediatricians recommend that. It definitely can work um, and uh, can help a baby learn to be a better sleeper at night. Um, most parents will say it doesn't really feel very good to do that because everything about you is to respond to your baby. And so it's quite uncomfortable sometimes when you have a baby screaming, your baby screaming on the other side of the door, um, you know, begging for you and for you not to go and meet their needs. Having said that, if you're sleep deprived, if you're driving into, you know, stop signs, or if you're getting into arguments with your, with your partner, um, you need to do something about that. And you need to um, get your baby into a better sleep routine.
So how do you get your baby in better sleep routine? Well, um, for the most part, the most common technique, well, there are kind of two main techniques that people use. One is a more gentle way, which is the baby cries, you go in there. Um, of course, you, you feed your baby first because most of the time that's what they're upset about. But say you just fed your baby and they're up an hour later and your baby isn't really suckling with, with interest. Um, you might hold your baby and rock them and then put them down and then they get upset and you pick them up again, calm them and put them down. You do that back and forth 10, 20, 30 times until they, they finally fall into sleep. Um, and you've got the white noise playing and that kind of stuff. Um, that's a more gentle method. Um, um, I have a book also called The Happiest Baby Guide to Great Sleep that talks about sleep over the first five years of life and techniques to get babies sleeping better. And, and that's discussed there. Um, many times your baby is more tenacious than you are. And so you're finding that you're going in and out over and over throughout the night. And it's even more exhausting for you to do that. So that doesn't always work for families. So the other way people do sleep training is called the cry it out routine, where the baby cries, you pop your head in the room, uh, assuming that the baby isn't hungry. So you mean you'll feed them every three hours or so um, through the night or four hours if they go that long. But, um, but when they cry, you pop your head and say, I love you, sweetheart, go to sleep, and boom, you're out. You just see that they didn't, your, your child didn't catch an arm in a strange position or didn't vomit or something like that. Um, and then you wait five minutes of crying or four minutes of crying, which is pretty hard to do. Um, they say, put cotton in your ears and gin in your stomach, you know, to be able to tolerate that. And, um, and then you pop your head in again. I love you. Go to sleep, sweetheart. But you don't walk in. You don't go to the bed. You don't touch your child or pick your child up because that gives them a, mi a mixed message. Um, the closer you get to the bed, the more they think you're going to pick them up because that's what you usually do. And so it gives them false hope. And in fact, makes them end up crying longer and more intensely. And so sometimes you have to go in three or four times or more than that. Once you get to 15 minutes, you're going every 15 minutes. And the first night can be bad and you might have an hour or even two hours of crying. And the second night can be bad as well. Usually by the third and by the fourth night, they're, they're pretty much sleeping through the night. That's something we don't really do before babies are four or five months old. Uh, because for those first months, they need to eat, you know, and that's really the deal that you make with them. So another way of solving the sleep problem is this special bed that, um, that my team and I created, which is called SNOO, um, which is short for snooze. And, um, and this is a bed that rocks and shushes babies, it imitates the womb, basically. And, um, um, and when the baby gets upset, um, the bed will rock and shush a little bit faster and a little bit louder and go up another level and another level, another level, which is imitating what an experienced nurse or caregiver would do when the baby is, um, is in your arms or on your lap. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, and, um, and so what happens is the, you put the baby down, it has a special swaddle blanket also, it's called the five second swaddle. That's very easy to do. You attach the swaddle to the bed there are little clips on the side of the bed that you attach the swaddle to, so your baby can't roll over. So we've measured now over 100 million hours of baby sleep in SNU over the last three years. Um, so it's been used by parents, you know, every state, every city, you know, truckers, teachers, lawyers, doctors, nurses are using this bed. And, um, and when you attach them to the bed, they cannot roll over. So we're, we're hopeful um, that, um, well, we definitely know we can keep babies from rolling into an unsafe position in the middle of the night. So you can swaddle babies and get all the benefits of swaddling without the worry that they're going to roll to an unsafe position. Um, and then once they're attached, you push the button and the bed starts to rock and shush and actually starts out very slowly, like you just rocking your baby in a rocking chair. Um, and like I said, if the baby's upset, it'll go a little faster and and louder and go up four different levels. And you can actually change those levels too because your baby may actually sleep better on a little bit higher level, just like driving them in the car. They may do best when you're driving on a bumpy road. Uh, some babies need that little bit of extra jiggle. And um, so you can, you can choose that in the, in the bed. And what parents tell us is that this is, 
I mean, what we've, we've now studied um, over 10,000 babies. So it's the largest study ever done on infant sleep. And we've demonstrated that within a week or two, we add one to two hours to a baby's sleep on average, some babies more than that. And, um, um, uh, and oftentimes with parents, they have an app and they can get a, you get a, a daily readout of the baby's sleep. And you can see, you wake up in the morning and you look at your app and you go, oh my gosh, honey, the baby woke up at three o'clock. Did you, I didn't even hear that, did you? Um, and the bed will respond and oftentimes calm the baby down in under a minute. About 50% of the time, it'll calm the baby in under a minute. And 50% of the time, it won't. It means the baby's hungry or needs a diaper change. So after a minute of crying, you can just turn the bed off and get your baby and take care of your baby's need. And what we find is that when you stimulate the baby in this way, you naturally sleep train the baby. So you don't have to do sleep training or cry it out routine. Um, and uh, usually by four months, you start liberating their arms from the swaddle and around five or six months, you, you, you stop the motion and just give them the sound. And um, that's a special weaning feature on the app. And then usually by six months, the baby's out um, of the bed and they're just seamlessly transitioned into the, into the crib. Um, so we sell these beds. We also rent these beds. So for under $4 a day, which is pretty much a Starbucks, you can get an hour or two more sleep. You can get peace of mind that your baby's gonna stay safely on the back all night long. And you can have really basically a 24 hour, seven day a week, babysitter or helper in the house. Because what many people will tell us is that snoo is like an extra pair of hands. So when you're cooking dinner or taking a shower or playing with your two-year-old or trying to get some sleep, um, the bed will hold in rock babies and give you a break, basically. And so this is, in a way, an answer to the, to the, um, to the, the need that we have for the extended family that we all, or so many of us, moved away from. Um, Snoo, I'm proud to say, is now the most awarded baby bed in history, and it's in, it's been actually taken into the permanent collection of the Smithsonian Institution as a, as a breakthrough uh, invention for the 21st century. And we're using it in dozens and dozens and dozens of hospitals, and um, and uh, doctors are recommending it, et cetera. So we're very proud of that. And and uh, of course, four dollars a day is not affordable to everyone. Um, but to be honest, I mean, mo many people are spending that on coffee or Red Bull just to stay awake with your babies. And I think that's why, um, why the bed has become so, uh, so popular. So um, let me leave it at that and get to uh, the questions that we have. Some of them I think I've answered through my own, you know, uh, chit chat here. Um, but the first one is, um, my six month old still eats two hours every night, um, all through the night. And I've tried to increase the uh, food during the day. And we started solid food about two weeks ago, but still no success. So in that situation, I would make sure that the baby has got white noise. I would um, make sure that the baby is not just eating during the day, but is, is getting sufficient amount of calories, meaning switching breasts or, um, or letting the baby um, drain the bottle. Because by six months, they can oftentimes eat a six ounce and even an eight ounce bottle of milk. Um, and the food is actually not helpful. The solid food that we give babies, people used to say, oh, give them, mix some rice cereal into the milk, but that doesn't really work um, because it doesn't have calories. Even the foods that we give babies, banana and carrots and you know, peas and whatever, squash, that's diet food. It's food you would eat if you want to lose weight. And so um, milk is much more caloric. And so if your baby is hungry all throughout the night, that's a sign, and they're gaining weight properly, which I'm assuming. If they're not gaining weight, they need to be checked to make sure they're getting enough milk. Something else is going wrong. But if they're gaining weight properly and they're peeing and poop, pooping a lot, then they're just not getting enough calories during the day. And so that's what you want to make sure that, they're, that they are being fed more often and a larger amount. Um, so with daytime naps, should I make the room dark or is it okay to have sunlight? Again, every baby is different, but in general, um, especially once the baby gets over two or three months of age, they're nosy, they're curious. And so you want to darken the room if you can um, to, um, to reduce your baby's being distracted and wanting to be social during the day. Um, so another family talked about sleep training. They said they tried to sleep train their four and a half week old baby, uh, which worked, but then at six weeks it fell apart. And 
that's the problem with sleep training at that early age and why I don't recommend it. Because at month two and three and four and five, they're going to go through growth spurts and colds and teething and sleep regressions and things that are just going to be a house of cards. Um, and ultimately, listen, in the beginning, your job is to meet your baby's needs. It's not to let them cry themselves into exhaustion. And so, um, at least personally, I wouldn't recommend sleep training babies before, you know, four or five months of age. Um, so then what about getting naps more consistently? Sometimes the baby naps for two hours, sometimes 20 minutes. And one of the things you can do there is using the white noise. Um, sometimes smells help babies recognize when it's nap time. You can use a little bit of lavender oil and just rub a tiny bit onto the mattress of the bed and your baby will smell that underneath the sheet and will be, it'll be like a reminder for the baby that this is the place for sleeping. Um, and then for naps, I wouldn't let your baby sleep over an hour and a half or two hours during the day because um, then they're going to get into that pattern and they're going to not just nap more erratically during the day, but they're also going to sleep less at night. Um, sleep routines. What is a sleep routine? So babies are creatures of habit. They learn by repetition. The more times you do something, the more they figure it out. They do that with breastfeeding, for example, or bottle feeding. They don't, they've never seen a bottle before or breastfeed. They don't know what to do. Um, um, when you bring the baby to the breast, you've got to touch the nipple to their mouth and tease them a little bit and get them to open their mouths really big so that you can get them on the breast and you have to do that over and over. And after a week, your baby's figured it out and they sometimes <laughs> when you're opening your bra, they'll open their mouth like, ah, I'm ready, you know, and they're anticipating what's going on because uh, even a one week old baby can learn. Um, um, and so that's why you might do a sleep routine to help your baby understand the message that now is the time that's coming that I'm gonna put you into the bed. And so sleep routine can be a little massage, it can be a bath, it can be rocking in your arms, of course, a feeding, a white noise machine, dimming the lights in the house. And I recommend dimming the lights maybe an hour before you put the baby down so that that's giving a signal to your baby's brain that sleep is coming. It starts the release of the melatonin from the brain and lets the baby get used to that. And for older babies, of course, you can sing songs and you can read books as part of your bedtime routine and uh, and cuddle up with them. I have to say, one of the questions about, about snooze, people go, well, should I be trying to have my baby nap out of the snooze so they get used to not being in snooze all the time? Or am I going to have a problem weaning the baby off of the bed at six months because my baby's gotten so dependent on rocking and trishing? So it turns out you don't have to worry about any of that. It just is so much easier. It just works out that use the snooze as much as possible then your baby learns what to expect. They sleep better and faster. And by six months or five months even, they're totally different. They they're now have learned how to be good sleepers. And so what happens is that you just, you just wean them. It's, it's so easy. You just turn the, the setting to where they have sound but no motion. The motion will come back if the baby cries. But most babies by that age aren't crying at night anymore. And within two or three nights, they're ready to be in the crib. End of story, you automatically sleep trained your baby. You didn't have to do any crying it out. And so that's something that parents really love. I should tell you, if you want a free snoo also, um, you might be able to get that through your employer. There are over 50 major employers that provide this as a benefit for their employees. They just rent it from us and we give it to the employees for four months, six months, um, so, um, so Facebook and Google and Hulu and Snapchat and Under Armour, many, many other companies provide their rental beds to their employees. And you could get a free snow by speaking to your, your employer about that. Um, and um, so let's see what else is here. What else is a good routine for a newborn or for an older child? So bedtime starts first thing in the morning, believe it or not. So by getting out for fresh air and getting sunlight and having a regular routine of feeding and naps during the day, you're setting up your child to learn about rhythms of the day and be more likely to develop a good rhythm at night. So you don't have to be, you know, obsessive about your schedule. Um, that exactly this is how long the baby will be between feedings and exactly I can't go out of the house because the baby has to be put down exactly at this time. 
Um, but still having routines in general is, is probably a good idea just to help you as much as to help the baby get through the day. Um, so I, I want to tell you just a tiny bit about, about toddlers. Um, and by toddler, I mean kids between eight months of age, so younger than you might be thinking, and, um, and five or six or seven or 32 or 56 years of age, because honestly, we all become toddlers if we get upset enough. And so the Happiest Toddler book is about um, teaching parents the skills to be the best toddler magician who ever lived. You know, how do I teach my child to be patient and cooperative and use their words and, um, and to um, be uh, respectful and ultimately to communicate their upsets, but not to scream and yell and, and have too many of these uh, tantrums. It turns out with babies, the key concept is the fourth trimester, meaning that uh, they're born three or four months too soon, and your job is to imitate the womb and hold them and rock them and trish them and feed them as much as possible. When you understand that, then it's pretty obvious what your job is with a new baby. For toddlers, the key concept is that toddlers are not little children, they're really little cavemen. They're primitives. They're unfrickin' civilized. And your job as a parent is to civilize them. You have to teach them to say please and thank you and wait in line, share your toys, and don't spit and scratch and don't throw the food. And these are all the, the laws of living in a culture that babies, that toddlers rather have to learn. And they don't learn it all at once. It takes them, it takes them years to really learn all of these rules. And so when you understand that, you're, that your toddler is like a caveman or a Neanderthal, then it helps you to, to recognize that even if they have a good day, they're not always going to have good days. You know, there'll be good days and bad days. And so you're, you're going to be more patient with yourself and with your toddler. And um, just like there are the five S's, there are many, many specific techniques in The Happiest Toddler that help you, like um, playing the boob and patient stretching and gossiping and, and toddleries and the fast food rule and lots of other kind of odd sounding names that will become like the back of your hand as you use those to really um, be, a, be a very skilled parent with your, with your toddler. But the one thing I do want to tell you about, one specific technique, which is one of the things that is confusing the parents, and we often do incorrectly, and it can have some pretty serious consequences, is um, when our child is screaming and really upset, we're taught now to acknowledge our child's feelings, which most people think means, honey, honey, no, no, honey, sweetheart, I know you're, honey, calm down. I know you're upset. I need you to calm down, sweetheart, calm down. That sounds reasonable, right? I mean, might be a way you speak to your coworker, but it's not the way you speak to a, 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 an upset, uh, out of control toddler or caveman. Because what happens when you're upset is you turn off your left brain. We all do. We become less logical, less reasonable, less eloquent, less patient, less, patient, um, less verbal. And we're all about the right brain. The right brain is the center of emotionality and fight or flight reflex and recognizing a face in a place, which toddlers are really good at, and nonverbal communication, so your tone of voice and gestures. So even with an adult who's upset, the words you say don't matter as much as the way you say the words. If you're with someone who's, who's grieving and they're very, very upset, you might just go, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm really, really sorry. And that means more than saying, I am so sorry. I know that's terrible. You must feel terrible, you know, or going, calm down, calm down. I know you're upset. I know you're upset, but you have to stop crying. I need you to stop crying so I can talk to you, which wouldn't feel good at all. And so what you want to do with an upset toddler or an upset best friend for that matter is narrate back using what I call toddlerese, which is short phrases, lots of repetition and mirroring a third of their emotion. So you might say to a little child who's upset, you, you're, 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 you're mad. You're, you're, you're mad. You're mad, 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 mad. You're really, really, really mad. You're so mad. Your face is mad and your body is mad. That seems like baby talk and seems kind of wrong. 
or it seems overly dramatic, but that's exactly the way you, the way you, you help a young child understand that you get their feelings, that you're respectful of them. Once they calm down, then you'll distract them or you'll give them suggestions or try to make them feel better or, or something like that. What's curious is that when children are very happy, we do this technique anyway. Uh, when they're very happy, we don't say, honey, I see you're very, very happy. I will tell father, right? We go, yay, good job. You did it. You did it. You were trying and you climbed up there and you tried so hard and your face is so, you're so happy. You're so proud of yourself. That's the way we acknowledge them when they're very happy, um, using the same general technique as we use when they're very unhappy. Um, and the reason that this is important is because if you respond to your child's unhappiness or frustration by saying, honey, honey, calm, sweetheart, calm down. I need you to calm down. The thing about emotions are, is if you don't express them, they don't go anywhere. They stay inside of you. And if you've been embarrassed or insulted or hurt, um, you know that, that those feelings stay deep. Those are wounds. And if you, if you can be with someone who you care about, who cares about you, and you can tell them how that felt and express it with the emotions that you felt at that time, that will be a healing experience. If you have someone you're angry at and you can tell them how angry you are and they can listen to you and respect that, you actually can have a better relationship than you ever had before. And so the key is not to um, stifle your child's feelings. It doesn't mean they can act on the feelings. They can't rip things off the wall or hit you. That you're going to stop right away. But you want to acknowledge their feelings in this toddlerese technique. And then oftentimes after four or five or six or eight or 10 times of repeating it, they settle down and they, you know, listen to you and then they're ready to be your friend and to go on to the next thing. That means you've taught your child how to how to what to expect from friends and their closest um, intimates from someone, how someone should respond to their feelings um, so that they will feel like they have the right to their feelings and they know how to pick a friend and pick a partner in life who's going to be respectful of them. Um, so, um, so those are the general things that I wanted to share with you. I know we could go on forever. My voice is giving out a little bit, but um, uh, there's so much more to talk about, about babies and toddlers and sleep and discipline. Um, but I hope that's been helpful. And um, for more information, please contact us. You can contact us through um, Instagram or Facebook or our website at happiestbaby.com. Of course, uh, lots more information on Peanut as well. And, um, and um, I wish you to be safe. Uh, take this pandemic seriously. Um, it's not going away anytime soon. And you uh, not only to protect your child, but you need to protect yourselves. You can only imagine how desperate the situation is if if parents get sick and have to be hospitalized and who's going to take care of your child. So be neurotic, be overprotective, um, keep your distance, keep your mask on, um, and take this all seriously because um, we need to we need to stop the spread of this in our community. Otherwise, um, this is going to be with us for a, a much, much longer period and we're all gonna suffer the consequences. So stay safe and thank you all for joining. Take care.